So, uh, I'm here to give the first lecture here. I'm Grégory Soyer. I'm actually working in the Paris area. Saclay, well, for anyone who's anywhere in the world is in the Paris area. For everyone in Paris, it's somewhere in another planet. Uh, so, th the first lecture here is about QCD and more generally collider physics, although collider physics now mostly means LHC physics or future colliders. And LHC physics, since LHC collides protons, as I hope everyone here knows, it's mostly QCD. So let me declare this mostly a QCD set of lectures. Uh, and probably uh, what you need to remember from the beginning, let me call that QCD 105. So it's not exactly QCD for uh, beginners in terms of I hope that you know uh, at least Feynman rules of QCD. I'll come back to that in a second. And I call it 105 because this is my office number in case you need to find me anywhere. So that's the two key words you need to remember just to begin with. Uh, so the other main point I'd like to make before I start is that as far as I can tell from the program, this is a very fairly vast uh, coverage and range of topics. So I suspect that not all of you here are working directly on QCD or experts in QCD or doing your PhD in QCD. So I'd like to keep these lectures uh, at least to some extent at as much, as as much introductory as possible uh, and also as much flexible as possible, which is something I can, doing at the blackboard is, is making it a little bit easier to do. Which means that if at any point, I mean, I don't have a fixed agenda for the week. Uh, that can evolve uh, through one, one lecture after the other. So if at any point there's something which is not clear or something that you think you've missed, some fundamentals you have missed, just don't hesitate to interrupt me. That's the first point. And second, I'll, I'll just give you the plan, what I was planning to do in, in at least the main steps of the lectures in a second. If there are things that are, that well, if, if there are topics there that you really want to see, just let me know. And if there are topics that you would have hoped to see and are not here, just let me know as well. And again, I'll come back to this in a second. So uh, it's impossible to cover all of QCD in five lectures of less than two hours. So I have to make a list. So the tentative list at the moment is just stay with a mostly perturbative QCD because I don't want to go into soft uh, too much into non-perturbative hydronization uh, stuff. Uh, and the main flow of the lectures is going to, well, th the main flow of the lectures is probably trying to go from a simple collider to a more complicated collider. Uh, so before I do that, let me ask you a question. Who here is working on QCD? About a third. Perturbative QCD, high energy QCD? Okay. Uh, who here is working more generally on, on LHC physics or collider physics? Uh, leaving aside QCD, because otherwise I'm going to have a hard time counting. Okay, and I guess all the rest is working on, I guess, cosmology, astroparticles, yeah, that sounds about right. Have I forgotten anything? Okay, again, I'm just trying to gauge a little bit what the audience is, so everyone can probably take something out of this. Uh, does everyone here know the Feynman rules of QCD? Everyone here knows, is there anyone here who doesn't know the symmetry group of QCD? Okay, at least this is a good start. So everyone has had QCD 101 to 104. Good. Uh, so the, the first thing I like to do, uh, oh, one caveat. I, my main activity is not teaching. My main activity is research. So usually when I write on the blackboard, I write on the blackboard for me, which sits something like a meter away from the blackboard. So people right there at the back may at some point have a hard time reading what I can clearly read from one meter away. So if I write too small, just, uh, Shout, don't throw anything, just shout, it's going to be fine. Uh, so the first thing I like to do is essentially QCD in E plus and minus collisions. Uh, at first sight, this might just be, well, from someone who 
is essentially new to particle physics, this might sound like complete nonsense because E plus electrons and positrons are not QCD object. But the idea is that if you do an E plus and minus collision, you can actually produce QCD in the final state of the collision. And so you can just study QCD in the final state without worrying at all about what happens in the initial state. Because this is just simple E plus and E minus, simple electromagnetics. And, and that means that actually E plus and E minus collisions are great labs to study QCD. Many of the fundamental, many of the steps that have reached to our current knowledge of QCD and even establishing QCD as a fundamental theory of strong interactions have been done in E plus and e minus collisions. So uh, there's a list of things and this is essentially what I'd like to do today. Okay, uh, th This is going to come with a list of keywords. So essentially what I'd like to do here is just make a simple order alpha s, first non-trivial QCD corrections here and show from there that there are key uh, I'm just quoting keywords here, we'll connect the dots through the week. Uh, key elements like infrared and collinear safety, which will be covered here. Uh, all sorts of final state uh, QCD dynamics, uh, including in particular uh, introducing objects that are omnipresent in QCD and uh, DHA in particular, which are jets. So these are essentially the three things I'd like to cover uh, today. And again, uh, there's two options here. Either I can focus on concepts and ideas and then cover a bunch of stuff, or I can just go in details over all calculations. Uh, my first inclination would be just to give you concepts because that's probably what's going to be more beneficial to all of you. If at some point you feel like there's a calculation you want me to go over in more details, just, again, just ask. Uh, so this is the first essentially big step. Then the next type of collisions, slightly more complicated, has anyone has an idea? Sorry? Hadron colliders, uh, that's, I don't know, half or double the answer. EV. So E or any, any kind of leptons. Here it can actually be neutrinos if you want as well. Uh, probably let me stick with E plus E minus or proton. And again, <coughs> this is, you, you want to start introducing some QCD in the initial state of the collision as well. And the easiest way to do that is start by introducing QCD only on one side and leave the other side simple. Uh, so this is something that's usually referred to as deep inelastic scattering. And what's the main thing that we can introduce in this kind of, in this kind of framework is essentially part and distribution functions, which everyone has probably heard here about PDFs. Again, if you haven't, uh, I hope it's going to become uh, to become clear in the in the next steps of days. And again, th there's a bunch of things I like to go over PDFs here, but that's the main uh, that's the main key step here, and we'll talk about the rest in the future. Maybe if I can quote again some related things. There's also divergences or UV divergences, but let me. In initial state, so it's again, it's initial state here versus final state there, and and things like PDF and PDF evolutions in this case. So these are the main uh, the main things I'd like to cover here. And again, there's a bunch of extra things I'd like to discuss here, depending on time and depending on what you what your specific requests are. <coughs> and last but not least, uh, the last thing I'd like to discuss here is QCD in uh, hadronic, pure hadronic collisions. So this is, this is mostly proton-proton in this case, or proton-antiproton, doesn't make a big, a big difference at this stage. Uh, where the main things I'd like to cover here is essentially, I'd like to do some kinematics Again, just to make sure things are clean in terms of the terminology, 
uh, discuss the anatomy of a collision and discuss basic processes in this case. And this includes, again, Drellian, uh, probably Digets, well, Jets and Digets, let me, Jets in general, and Digets in terms of uh, probably fragmentation functions as well. Let's, let's see where we get there. So these are the main three blocks of the lectures. Uh, I would say you should count at least one, one set of lectures for each. Uh, Depending on detail, this can cover the whole week if, uh, well, depending on the level of details you want. Uh, then there's a guest list. There's a list of at least I'd like to mention one way or another, even if it's just passing through them quite, uh, quite quickly on, on Friday. But uh, for each of the topics that I'm going to write now, if there's any more specific, if there's anyone here who wants to hear more about that topic because it's something they've encountered in their work either directly or indirectly or something that they always wondered about, uh, just ask me and I'll try to spend more than five minutes or more than 10 minutes on, on each of these topics. Uh, I cannot spend hours, hours on each of them, obviously, so if there's too many requests, I'll have to make a choice. But uh, I'll try to accommodate this as best as possible. So there's uh, what I can call as, as, say, more advanced topic, Uh, there's a bunch of things here, uh, and it's probably what I would say uh, related to proton-proton collisions mostly, but probably things which are a bit more modern, not just textbook material, but things which are probably relevant to uh, today's phenomenology at the LHC. Uh, there is first of all uh, Monte Carlo generators. Monte Carlo or, or event. Again, everyone here probably knows what it is. I'd like to just explain a little bit what kind of physics there is in, this, in these beasts. That can be done in 10 minutes or five minutes easily. Uh, if you want to hear more, just let me know. Uh, there's a whole thing that goes under the name of amplitudes. Uh, that's a field. There's conferences called amplitudes now. Uh, and this includes mostly either next to leading order or nowadays it's next to next to, it's evolving towards next to next leading order. Uh, so calculations of QCD at a fixed order in the best possible way. Uh, again, this can be skimmed over. I can give you basic details in, in just five to 10 minutes. Uh, let me know if you want more. Uh, in actually completely orthogonal directions to uh, trying to compute fixed order amplitudes, uh, we can discuss all order calculations, uh, which the jargon here is called resummations. Uh, this is something that I can probably just give you a very small taste of it in a few minutes. If you want to go there, I think at least it needs at least half an hour, maybe an hour. This would probably be half a lecture. Again, this can take two lectures a whole week, if you insist, right? Any of these could take the whole week, even more. Uh, then there's probably a few other fun things uh, that we can discuss. One is, well, one object that happens everywhere in QCD, something called jets. And uh, many of you have uh, a basic understanding of what a jet is, probably. Uh, something that I've done in the past and tends to be quite fun is something to see to what extent a jet is or is not uh, a QCD pattern. If you don't know what this is, you probably don't want to hear about it, so don't worry. And the last 
there's one or two. Yeah, there's two other things I'd like to discuss. Uh, well, I can potentially discuss. Another one is jet substructure. Something that has gained importance noticeably in searches for new physics at the LHC. Uh, and so again, I can either mention it in passing or spend uh, as much time as you want on this. And the last thing is probably a bit, goes in a different direction, but again, if someone, thinking, someone here is working on that or maybe interested, that's all something I can cover, which is QCD in heavy ion collisions. That, that rather goes into the spirit of trying to go from a simple collider, which was E plus E minus, and then complexify things more and more. Uh, colliding a heavy nucleus is obviously much more complex. It's a much more complex object than just a single proton. Uh, so this goes into adding extra complexity, and this essentially means trying to give you a taste of what extra complexity there is by colliding heavy nuclei compared to just simple uh, simple QCD partons, or oh, sorry, simple QCD hadrons. Is there anything here, again, if this list can probably go on, right? So if there's anything here that you were expecting to hear from these lectures and is not here, just just come and find me at the end. Uh, the earlier the better, because that gives me more time to actually plan for it. But but that's essentially what I had in mind for uh, for this week. So essentially, basic uh, QCD, I would say, uh, it's about master level kind of lectures for the for the basic parts and the top part of the blackboard. Uh, the bottom here is probably slightly more advanced topics, for which at the very least I will give you a taste of what happens. And if there's anything, and there's, don't worry, there's room for uh, for at least discussing two of these topics probably in the week. So if there's anything else, just come and let me know. I can probably even leave a sheet of paper here. So just write uh, write that you're interested in one or the other topic. Otherwise, I'll pick them myself. Any questions so far? Are you ready to get your hands dirty then? Okay, well, QCD in E plus and minus collision it's, is maybe not what I will call get our hands dirty because it's actually a very, uh, very simple system. So th the basic way to produce QCD is, is actually to start with, you do collide E plus and E minus, right? And we want QCD in the final state. So what's the easiest QCD system you can produce in this case? I didn't hear. Drelian? Drelian is actually this, but the opposite way around. So I'll, so you do an E plus E minus. In this case, let me, let me act on this. Uh, say E plus E minus, uh, E plus E minus. Going to a photon, going to Q Q bar. Uh, what we usually refer to as Relian is the opposite. Essentially, QQ bar going to photon going to E plus and minus. Uh, I'll come back to that here. In this case, Q and Q bar could come from protons in the initial state. So, Relian is exactly the same process, but essentially reverted. Uh, looked from right to left instead of left to right. So, this is the most simple production of QCD you can do with an E plus collider, E plus E minus collider. You go through a photon and photon couples, quarks are charged, so quarks can couple to the photon, and so you do produce a QQ bar pair from, uh, from a photon. Uh, I'll write a few of the kinematics here just to make sure we have the notations right for what follows. So I will call P1 and P2 the incoming momentum. If you want, I have notes for all of this. So I can don't don't worry about. It. I can I can send you the link at some point. Uh, yeah, there's something I forgot to mention. I, I can send you links to basically everything here, including details of some some details of the calculations for uh, for all the basic stuff. For this, 
for all of this, at the very least, I can give you references, uh, and I will do when I, when I go over those. Uh, so if you don't have time to take detailed notes, again, I can, I can give you a list of links and references, uh, probably towards the end of the week. So uh, P1 and P2, uh, it's usually interesting to show P1, to consider a center of mass of the collision, because then you go E plus E minus in the center of mass with each of the same energy coming left and right, and then the system is just, uh, the overall system is at rest. So the photon is at rest. So typically, I w again, this is mostly trying to uh, introduce notations that I will probably use through the week, so might as well get things clear in the beginning. So the, the, the for vector for P1, if the center of mass energy is square root of s, the for vector for the collision will be 0, 0, square root of s over 2, square root of s over 2, and one of the reasons here is that I'm usually using the notations where I put the energy at the end. Uh, hopefully that will become clearer yeah. Oh, there is a dark reason for that. I'll, uh, and you'll have to wait for this. <laughs> so, uh, in that case, P2 is actually trivial. It's 0, 0, minus square root of s over 2 and square root of s over 2. So the whole system P1 plus P2 is indeed uh, at rest. With, a, with an energy square root of s, that's the center of mass energy of the collision, and I'm assuming e plus e minus come along the z-axis. So, uh, similarly, I'll denote my k1 and k2, the outgoing quark and antiquark. And if you do that, again, this is textbook uh, kindergarten kind of calculation. So I won't go in detail over the calculation of this, uh, of this process. If you do that at the end of the day, uh, there's, there's probably only one expression I want. The one expression I want is that if you do that, the cross-section, well, the overall cross-section, this can be integrated fully over the final state. The overall cross-section you get for e plus and minus 2q q bar is just uh, some nc times some the square of the charge of the of the quark. Uh, let me actually leave a bit of space here. Times some sigma zero and sigma zero is uh, four pi over two s. No, it doesn't work. Three s. Yeah, three s. Nothing worth really jumping to the roof here. Uh, well, now, maybe 30 years ago, this would have been some great discovery. Uh, so first, first remark, this is exactly the cross-section for e plus and minus going to mu plus mu minus. So imagine instead of having quarks and antiquarks or QCD objects in the final state, you have just pure muons or you stick with the electromagnetic process. Uh, this, is, this may even be a process you have already calculated. Uh, so the thing here is insta if instead of producing muons, you produce q q bar, you have essentially the same kinematic dependence, so constant over s times the square of the electromagnetic constant. Uh, the square essentially because you have one, two electromagnetic uh, couplings here in the amplitude. When you compute the cross-section, you square it, so you have four powers of, uh, of the electromagnetic coupling, which gives you alpha electromagnetic squared. Uh, it's QCD, but you don't have any QCD coupling. The coupling of the photon to the, to the quark is actually, this is an electromagnetic coupling, so there's no QCD coupling in anywhere. Uh, the question here is, where does QCD happen here? Where do you see QCD here? 
and again, there's two places where you see QCD. One is the NT, which is the number of the number of colors. Essentially, the fact that a quark and antiquark can be produced in any any of their three possible colors, red, green, and blue, if you wish. And so this means that you have three times as many possible final states in QQ bar compared to mu plus mu minus, because you can produce three different kinds of quarks for one and a single one muon, uh, which hence a factor three here. And uh, the fact that the coupling here is related to the charge of the quark here, which is not exactly the same charge as the muon. There's a factor EQ here, which is the relative charge of the, of the quark here, one third or two thirds, depending on the uh, depending on which flavor you're talking about. So now if you're really summing over all possible, so this would be the result for a single uh, quark flavor in the final state. Now if you want to be inclusive in any, any pair of quarks you can produce in the final state, this has to be summed over all possible quark flavors. And the all possible quark flavor, the number of quark flavors that you have access to at a given center of mass energy, of course, depends on the uh, center of mass, of the, uh, the, the energy of the center of mass of the collision. Uh, for example, if you make an E plus E minus collision at something like two or three or a few GeVs, you don't have enough energy to produce a, B, a BB bar pair. And so this sum here will restrict to light flavors. And if you make a collision at several TVs, you also have to include bottom and tops in your, in your sum here. So this is something that was actually uh, used. You may have seen plots of the ratio of sigma e plus e minus to QQ bar, or sigma e plus e minus going to hadrons, in this case for the full, the full beast, divided by this cross-section. And you obviously, you, you do expect to see thresholds in this cross-section as you cross flavor channels, where more and more of the final state quarks do contribute to this. Uh, is there anything I've forgotten here? I don't think so. Any questions so far? Good. So this was the. So this is a warm up. Uh, so now I want to get really into QCD stuff. So how do we go into QCD stuff? Any idea? What's the next most simple QCD process you could think of in this type, in this type of collisions? Radiation of a gluon, thank you. So, there's two ways to do that, or, well, at least two ways to do that. You can either radiate, let me draw this maybe a bit smaller, otherwise I'm... So you can either radiate a gluon from the quark, or you can radiate a gluon The antiquark, okay? And this is essentially the kind of process I'd like to discuss uh, for today. I need to keep an eye on time. So, Several things here. First, uh, let me discuss again kinematics because this is what something I'll need. This K1 and K2, which I'll keep as the momenta of the quark and the antiquark, and I'll denote the momentum of the gluon by K3. Uh, again, it is more or less a textbook exercise to compute the corresponding amplitude here. What you would have to do is actually to sum those two graphs, square them, compute all the Feynman graphs and, and whatnot. Uh, that leaves the square of this graph, the square of this graph, and the interference term. Uh, it's not such a complicated calculation, but unless you insist, I will not do it. I will instead give you directly the answer of this calculation and discuss the physics that goes with it. If there's something in the calculation that you want, I think the calculation is in the notes, at least parts of it. So if you want it, you'll have it in the, in the link I'll send you at the end. Uh, 
for the sake of notations, I'd like to discuss first the phase space because we'll need to integrate over the phase space at the end to get cross sections and things like that. Uh, so I'll first discuss the phase space, then give you the answer for the amplitudes, and then discuss the physics that goes with it. So in terms of the phase space, you'll, ha you'll need an integration over a three-body phase space. Let me denote that by d phi 3, which is an integration. Uh, let me try to keep the same notations that I have here. There's going to be a product for i going from 1 to 3 d 4 k i over 2 pi to the fourth time 2 pi delta of k i squared times 2 pi to the fourth delta of p1 plus p2 minus some k i. Uh, nothing again. This is so this thing here is just the matrix, well, it's just the, the phase space to produce one of these particles. This constraints, this constraint here tells me that I'm producing, um, the particle that I'm producing is in the final state, so it is massless. So I'm having this particle on shell. And this is just momentum conservation, all right? Uh, momentum conservation for the fact that the final state has to have the same momentum as the initial state. Uh, another way to write this guy is just d3ki. In this case, this is just integrating over the spatial coordinates of, of momentum divided by 2 pi cubed times 2 twice the energy of, of particle i. There's a bunch of variable I'll need because I'll, I'll, I'll need to discuss kinematics in, in all sorts of details. Uh, there's obviously Keeping all the momenta is obviously an overkill because you typically, so each of the particle being on shell is essentially three degrees of freedom. So you're left with three degrees of freedom for each of the particles. That makes nine degrees of freedom if I write it down this way. But then there's four constraints coming from here. So at the end of the day, I only need five variables to describe the whole final state. All right. And so for the five final, so for the five variables, I'll take, uh, well, the first thing to realize is that you can add e plus and minus to in the center of mass of the collision. So the three outgoing particle will somehow be in a plane somewhere, all right? And so I'm going to take three variables which are going to describe how that plane is, is oriented. So for this, I can, for example, uh, take uh, one axis of that plane to be in the direction of k3 and then something else that tells me exactly the orientation of k1, uh, k1 and k2. So this is essentially two directions to tell me where k3 goes, and then uh, one extra angle to tell me how k, this k1, k2 system is oriented with respect, well, around k3. So uh, there's several ways to put that, but in a way you can use three Euler angles Uh, say alpha, beta, and gamma, uh, which essentially describe the orientation of the final state of the plane of the three outgoing particles with respect to uh, to the lab frame. All right. So this is just uh, again basic. Even classical mechanics would do this, something like that. Uh, there's different conventions. You can align any of the particles with any of the axes, and so. Uh, I won't enter too much into the details here. Uh, so this means I'm left with two variables which really will describe the internal kinematics of K1, K2, and K3 within that plane. And the variables I'm going to use are actually Xi, which is defined as 2Ei over square root of S. And uh, you're going to obviously tell me you need two variables and you're giving me three because there's x1, x2, and x3, and it's actually not exactly three because because of energy conservation, e1 plus e2 plus e3 has to be square root of s, so this means that x1 plus x2 plus x3 is two, and any of the xi has to be between zero and one. And this is something you should keep in mind because we're going to use this over and over again for the next hour. Uh, 
in, in that framework, the phase space, or in that context, the phase space, d phi 3, can be written as, there's stupid factors in front of it, s over 32 times 2 pi to the fifth times an integration d alpha d cos beta d gamma times dx1 dx2. That's the full, uh, this would be the full phase space after you've imposed, uh, essentially after you've imposed momentum, uh, momentum conservation, energy momentum conservation. All right? I'll have to do a bit more kinematics in a second, but at least this is the first, uh, this is the first one you'll need to, uh, to remember. Then there's all, that always happens. I'm always getting lost within my notes. Uh, okay, so step one done. We have the phase space. If you want to compute a process like the one there at the top, the first step is always compute the phase space. The second one is compute the amplitude, okay? Uh, so with summing first, second, you're squaring them. You're computing the square of the first, the square of the second, so roughly the same. And you compute the interference term. At the end of the day, well, you sum, <coughs> sorry, I'm going to sum over all possible initial states. I'm not going to consider things like polarized collisions or things like that. So I'm summing over all possible initial states. Uh, well, averaging over all possible initial states. I'm summing over all possible final states, and at the end of the day, you get the total matrix element squared. Is, again, some numbers. There's a four. There's a four pi cube. There's an alpha electromagnetic squared. There's an alpha s, there's a c, f, and c, that's constants I'll discuss in a second, and there's the, then there's a kinematic beat, which is p1 dot k1 squared plus p1 dot k2 squared plus p1, sorry, p2 k1 squared plus p2 k2 squared, these are all scalar products or dot products, divided by k1, k3, k2, k3. Let's factor S in the words. All right? Well, yes. The second is alpha S, yes. Yeah. Do you expect alpha is there? Yeah, I mean, we've added a gluon. The gluon is, coupling, is coupled to the quark line. That means we'll have a QCD coupling here or there, and another one in the complex conjugate amplitude. So this is going to give you, obviously, an alpha S. Uh, the alpha agnomatic squared is the same as the one we had in sigma zero. It's just all the rest of the uh, of the electromagnetic couplings, and then you're left with a kinematic bit, which comes from all being able to apply the Feynman rules without making a mistake, or asking any mathematical package to do it for you, and then. The NC here is essentially the same. I'm missing a charge quark somewhere, aren't I? Yeah, I'm probably missing an EQ square somewhere. So this and EQ square are just the same as the one we had in, in this part. And the CF is essentially the fact that when you couple the glue onto the quark line, you'll get all sorts of SU3 matrices. And the SU3 algebra is going to give you a CF. Does anyone here remember what CF is? Sorry? It's a rational number. It's so far so good. It's even a function of NC. So CF, let me put it here, CF, so there's essentially two, well, 
let me give you what CF is. CF is essentially NC squared minus 1 over 2NC, which is 4 thirds in QCD. And that goes together with CA, which is NC, which in QCD is, is 3. And essentially, 1 is related to uh, the fundamental, it's, it's essentially the trace of fundamental, it's related to the trace of fundamental generators of SU3. Uh, in a nutshell, whenever you have a gluon emitted from a quark line, you would expect a factor CF because you'll get a Gelman matrix, a QCD matrix in the fundamental representation for that QCD vertex. Uh, and CA is essentially related when you have a gluon emitted from a gluon line. So imagine, I, I, I don't know, do E plus and minus to Higgs and Higgs decaying to glue glue and then the gluon emits a gluon. I don't know, uh, any Gedangan experiment. Uh, in that case, you would expect a CA instead of a CF here. And again, this is related to the fact that when you have a glue glue vertex, you have an FABC, which is the adjoint representation of QCD, and essentially the trace of the square of that is going to give you a CA. So CF is no big surprise here. CF is really the fact that you do have QCD in here. And when I was referring earlier to the fact that E plus and minus are great to test QCD, think about four years ago when it was not so clear whether QCD was the exact or the good theory for strong interactions, this is one way of testing things. If you try to measure a process like this, one or another will come back, there's, there's several ways of measuring this, but this is a definite prediction of QCD, the fact that there is a constant here that is directly related to the, uh, to the basic structure of a the theory, the fact that this is SU3. If you take a different group, you get a different factor here. So the fact that there is, there is this kind of factors in QCD calculation allows you to test whether these factors are correct and whether QCD is indeed a good candidate for, uh, for the theory of strong interactions. So this is exactly why uh, easy processes like, like E plus and minus collisions are actually very good tool, very nice tools to get to uh, to understand and test and test QCD. Good. So all right. So at the end of the day, what you want is to integrate that squared amplitude over that phase space. Uh, there's five integrations to do. For most of the, the, the applications I'd like to discuss, I just don't give a damn about the uh, orientation of the plane. So I'm just going to integrate that out. Obviously, K1, K3, and K2, K3 do not depend on the Euler angles. But products which involve one final state particle with one initial state particle will depend on the orientation of that plane through essentially sinus and cosine, uh, sine and cosine of alpha, beta, and gamma. And so this is essentially integrate a rational function, or oh, sorry, a, a polynomial of sine and cosine over alpha, beta, and gamma, which I hope is something you can do. I, I don't want to specify it, mostly because uh, the exact details of these products depends on the conventions you're using for the Euler angles. Anyway, at the end of the day, what you get is that G sigma, so D2 sigma, over dx1, dx2 is, uh, well, there's putting all these factors with this, you'll get integration over alpha, beta, and gamma of all these guys. It's only p1, p2, and th these numerator products that have to be integrated over. And you get something like eq squared times nc sigma zero alpha is cf over 2 pi times x1 squared plus x2 squared over 1 minus x1, 1 minus x2. There's one or two things I'd like to, uh, I'd like to do here before uh, proceedings. So, uh, First of all, integration of, as I said, in integration of alpha, beta, and gamma of all these guys are essentially just expected to give you some, some numbers, potentially times s, probably times s squared in this case. Uh, 
But basically, all these guys just give you just give you numbers. They're, they're independent and independent of the kinematics internal to the plane. Well, there's the next one is two square factor, which actually come from k1 and k2 after integration. Sorry. So uh, the part that I'd like to discuss here is first of all the prefactors and then the kinematics. So again, in terms of prefactors, there's no huge surprise. What do you do recover is a factor. I've made it explicitly to factor out something which is just the same as the uh, leading order bond level process. So e plus e minus, so sorry, the leading, the leading e plus e minus qq bar process. Uh, then there's a correction. There's the factor alpha is CF over 2 pi, which is essentially purely the QCD, uh, QCD dynamics at play, as we just discussed. So there's a QCD coupling and a color factor associated with the structure of the SU3 structure of QCD. And then there's the kinematics. And this is the part we want to discuss now. So the first thing I like to do is actually make a little bit of a calculation for K1 dot K3. All right? So I'd like to compute k1 dot k3. Uh, so uh, how do we do this? So k1 dot k3, I can't remember how I went there. Yeah, there's several ways to do this. So k1 dot k3, you can always do that explicitly, all right? K1 got, dot K3 is going to be E1, so dot E3. These particles are on shell, so K1 squared and K3 squared are on shell, so, which means that the, the three momentum of K1 is E1 and the three momentum of K3 is E3, because, uh, well, the modulus of the three momentum, because they're on shell. And so this is going to be 1 minus the cosine of the angle between 1 and 3. All right? I did it completely differently in my notes, so hopefully I'm going to go back to my feet at some point. Uh, the other thing you can do here is use momentum conservation. So the fact that k1 plus k2 plus k3 is just equal to p1 plus p2, and p1 plus p2 if you remember p1 plus p2 is just a, a vector which is square root of s, well, 0, 0, 0, square root of s. Uh, so which is the one I want here? k1 not k3. So what I can do is move k2 to the other side. I have k1 plus k3, which is equal to p1 plus p2 minus k2. And so if I square this, what I'm going to get is k1 squared, which is 0, k3 squared, which is 0. So I'm getting a 2 k1 dot k3 on this side. So let me square, I'm actually squaring this left and right. All right? On the right-hand side, then, what I get is p1 plus p2 squared, that's s. k2 squared, that's, that's 0. And then minus 2, and the product of K2 with P1 plus P2 is just going to pick the energy component because P1 plus P2 only has an energy component. So minus 2 square root of S times E2. All right? That's just basic kinematics. I've just used momentum conservation at this stage. Uh, so what I can do here, I want to transform this. I told you I'm, I'm not interested in working directly with k's. I want to use x's at the end of the day because that's my in-plane kinematics. So I'm going to divide this. Uh, so 2 k1 dot k3, uh, let me divide it by a factor of 2. So k1 dot k3 is s over 2. So I'm just factoring out a factor s over 2 here times uh, the, the term there's a 1 minus 2 e2 over square s. 
So I've just factored out a factor of s here, which gives you 1 minus 2 e2 over square root of s, and a factor of 1 half coming from divided by 2 left and right. Anyone recognizes this? x2. So k1 dot k3 is s over 2 times 1 minus x2. And similarly speaking, uh, k1 dot, sorry, k2 dot k3 would be s over 2 times 1 minus x1. This is just the, the symmetric. It's easy to, sh again, once you've done it for one, you can easily do it for the other. So the reason I went through this small calculation is actually to show you that the 1 minus x1 that you see here is coming from the k2.k3 here, and the 1 minus x2 is coming from the k1.k3 here. Okay? So at the end of the day, I mean, this is a very nice pocket formula, which you can use to make lots of physics, and we will. Uh, do you see anything strange with this? So imagine I want to compute the cross-sections for e plus e minus to go to hadrons, OK? Total cross-section. I have e plus e minus, e plus e minus in my initial state. I want any, any form of QCD final state. Uh, we've done the lowest possible order. It's zeroth order in, in alpha s. It's just the result here. That's the lowest possible order of the perturbation theory you can do, e plus e minus going to e bar. The first order correction in QCD is essentially going to be the radiation of one extra gluon as we did here. So if I want to do the total e plus e minus to hadron collision, I now have to integrate any twin, keeping the final state completely inclusive, I have to integrate this over x1 and x2. Sorry? That, that doesn't quite work. You need to speak louder. I can't hear you. X1, X2 can go to 1, and that's an issue. Is it really an issue? So. Great, it does diverge. There's nothing I can do against that. It will. If I do integrate this over x1 and x2, I will get infinity. So there's no, we, well, let me reassure you first. We haven't done something wrong here. We're just missing something. The question is, what are we missing? And it is something generic. Radiation from? Uh, does an electron or a positron couple to gluons? So no radiation from initial state. Virtual corrections. So it means that on top of all the graphs that I have there, uh, and now I'm starting to run out of space, so let me come back here. On top of these three graphs there, I do need I do need virtual corrections. So virtual corrections, there's essentially three possible virtual corrections we can get. One is a gluon here. Two is a gluon here. Three is a gluon there. So gluon can couple to any of the two lines. Uh, So you need to also compute this, but uh, do you? Uh, by this I mean imagine, imagine we try to apply the same procedure as we did for the process there at the top. So we're going to say I'm going to sum these three guys, square them, and get my vertical correction. Everyone agrees to that? Great. So, yeah, excellent. 
That's, yeah, that's actually a question I've had several times, saying if you square this, you get, how many QCD coupling do you get if you square this? I have two QCD coupling on my amplitude. If I square this, I actually do get four QCD coupling. So this is not an alpha S correction. It's an alpha squared correction. Uh, the trick is that actually when you compute the full QCD amplitude, you actually also have to sum all possible Feynman graphs, which give you the same final state in this case. So you will also have to add to this the uh, the born level, which is just e plus e minus to q q bar. So if I do this plus e plus e minus to q q bar, there's actually going to be an interference term between this guy and any of these three, or, or vice versa, an interference term between uh, well between either this in the real in the initial state or this in the uh, in the amplitude or in the complex compl conjugate amplitude. And in this case, if you take the interference between this and this gluon loop diagram in this case, you would just get two QCD couplings and that gives you indeed something which is alpha s and of the same order as this guy. Now, again, you can use Feynman rules to compute this. Do you expect this to be finite? So if I integrate this over all possible final states for the quark and the anti-quark using Feynman rules, there's a, there's a momentum in the loop here because this is, well, there's always a, a free momentum in that loop which can be anything you want, which I can integrate over. Do you expect something finite by computing this graph? Yes, no, maybe, depends on constants of nature. It should be. At the end, and that's the operative word, it should be infrared safe at the end, meaning it should be infrared safe if I take this, if I take all the contribution at one given order of perturbation theory. So if I take both the real gluon emissions and the virtual corrections, I'm expected to get something finite in the end. And since this is obviously infinite if I integrate over x1 and x2, I also do expect this to be infinite. All right, just basically I do expect this to be infinite. Oh, well, in the natural, whenever you have a loop integration, this, the momentum in this loop can, well, there's two, two limits here. The momentum in this loop can be as big as it wants. So this means this type of graph has a UV, diver UV divergence, yes. Uh, what do you typically do with UV divergences? UV divergences are renormalized. So essentially, if all the UV parts of this graph are going to be reabsorbed into essentially the renormalization of the strong coupling or renormalization of the, of the quark mass if, if we were working with, with massive quarks. Uh, on the other hand, the momentum in this loop here can be as soft as it wants. So in that case, we speak about infrared. And in this case, there's nothing that shields this, this infrared divergence. Uh, so this means that this amplitude is also going to be infinite. I'm actually going to discuss in lots of details the fact that these are uh, infrared divergences in a second. The key point is that, in principle, there's a theorem that tells you that if you sum the, in, the, the real and virtual corrections, at the end of the day, you're expected to get something finite. OK? So it, it's, th there's several ways to compute this. In practice, people would usually work in, uh, in, D, well, in, in D dimensions, in, uh, in the dimensional regularization framework, where you go slightly off the four dimensional of the phase space, of the, of, well, four dimensions of the, of the phase space, and uh, phase space for every single particle. And you get poles when you try to go close to D equals four. And at the end of the day, we're working in d minus epsilon or 4 minus epsilon, 4 plus or minus epsilon dimensions. You hope that when you stop, well, you can in that case compute both real and virtual because they become finite. And when you sum them up, you expect that, that you get something finite. So in, in this case, what you do get if you, if you work in, in d equals yeah, 4 minus 2 epsilon dimensions, what you get is, you, well, you obviously need to redo that calculation in, in 4 minus 2 epsilon dimensions. So you get d to sigma over dx1, dx2, which is, again, there's an eq squared, nc sigma 0, there's an alpha scf 
over to pi, there's some function which is, say, some t of epsilon. Let me call it a generic function of epsilon. This is an x1 squared plus x2 squared uh, minus 2, sorry, minus epsilon. 2 minus x1 minus x2. 1 minus x1 to the 1 minus epsilon. 1 minus x2. 1 minus epsilon. And t of epsilon is uh, 3 minus 2 epsilon times gamma 2 minus 2 epsilon. And there's a numerator. Again, I, I'm, I won't use that at all. It's just to give you uh, details here. So that's what you get for the real part and for the virtual piece. I suspect I have it here. So th yeah, the reason I want to sh show you this, t of epsilon is essentially a constant, right? If you take if you take epsilon very small, uh, can neglect this. The gamma function just gives you uh, just gives you one in this case, uh, two actually, uh, and then there's there's sorry, this is factor of no sorry one here, and so this is. Uh, this is just this is just one. So t, t of epsilon is essentially one plus small corrections. Uh, now the key point is that here you see that x one the x one and x two divergences are now regulated. Okay, so if I integrate this over x one and x two, these th these factors which were divergent in this expression can now be integrated over. All right. So if I do that, at the end of the day, I do get the cross-section for e plus and minus for q, q bar, to produce q, q bar gluon, and say the real piece. I can do the integration of x1, x2 in this case, and you get e q squared times n c sigma zero alpha s c f over two pi t of epsilon times something which is minus 2 over, sorry, plus 2 over epsilon squared plus 3 over epsilon plus 19 over 2 plus order epsilon. And then I can do the same thing for these graphs actually the interference tends between these graphs and the, uh, the lowest order process. And if I do that for the virtual piece, I find eq squared nc sigma zero alpha s cf over two pi t of epsilon times minus two over epsilon squared minus three over epsilon minus eight plus order epsilon. Right? Well, all right. Uh, I hope you're right with this because you have to. I won't do the calculation. And that one, I don't have the details for it in the calculation. So unless you want to spend a week with me on this, don't. Well, no, the week is actually an overkill. But at least an hour on this. All right? So uh, a few observations, again, trying to stick with basic observations. There's if you go to epsilon close to zero, so if you try to go back to four dimensions, this one diverges. And this is the trace of the infrared divergences we were, we were talking about. And you have it both in the real part of the amplitude and in the virtual part of the amplitude. And you get both double poles and single poles. We'll come back to that uh, at length in, in what follows. The key point here is that if you now sum the region virtual corrections, these divergent terms in both the virtual and real corrections do cancel. And so that means that sigma q q bar gluon, the total cross section at the end, e plus e minus going to hadrons, the first non trivial alpha s correction, is actually going to be finite because t of epsilon goes to 1 and this number here goes to 3 half. 16 over 2 minus 8 is 3 half. All right? So if you do that, you actually find that sigma, so the cross section e plus e minus going to hadrons, is the same process as we had earlier. So nc 
times the sum over quark flavors eq squared sigma zero. There's a one coming from over there, leading order. And the first alpha s correction that comes to this is actually going to give you a plus alpha s over pi. Then there's higher order corrections if you want to compute the two loop corrections. So two loop emissions plus one loop virtual, one real emission uh, plus uh, two loop virtual in this case. So this is So the, I, I actually skipped one thing which is, which is non-trivial. I told you that essentially UV divergences go into renormalization. So here, these epsilon divergences are actually uh, infrared divergences. Uh, question is, do you see why you have infrared divergences in the real Amplitude. So in, in this question can be phrased in two different ways. Do you see why physically this graph here has infrared divergences? That's one. And two, do you see why this factor 1 minus x1 is actually something which is related to infrared physics? It's actually the same question, but... So one, so th there's there's actually two ways to make x1 or say x2 going to either x1 or x2 going to going to one. One is indeed to make k3 infinitely soft. So I'll, that's actually my next. Uh, so let me let me make space. I'm actually reverting completely the order of my notes, but let's see let's see where this is getting us. Uh, So, so one is k3 going to zero. And that's something called the softer divergence. That's one way to get x1. In that case, both x1 and x2 go to zero, actually. Sorry, both x1 and x2 go to one. Okay, the other one is Kalinar. With either K1 or K2. And this goes back to this relation here, essentially. So another way to write this, all right, so if I take this expression here and this expression there, I can have s over 2, so s over 2 times 1 minus x2 is e1, e3. So e1, e3 is, uh, uh, can use the definition of x's, so it's s over 4 times x1, x3, 1 minus cosine theta 1, 3. Okay? So I can actually simplify these guys left and right to give me a factor 1 half. So 2, x1, x2. So you see from this case that if the angle between 1 and 3 goes to 0, this factor goes to 0 and x2 goes to 1. So this is the kinematic equation which is at play here. And so this is exactly what we call the collinear divergence in the sense that if emission 3 becomes collinear, which means in the same direction, that small angle with respect to, say, k1, then it's actually x2 that goes to 1. All right? And so this is called the collinear divergence. And essentially what people usually call the infrared, these are both infrared divergences. Uh, 
but my question stands. Why is that infrared? These two divergences here have something in common uh, and think about, the, look at the top graph there. Look, for example, at this graph here. What happens if K3 becomes infinitely soft? So if the energy of K3 goes to zero, or what happens if K3 becomes infinitely collinear with K1? What happens in terms of the Feynman bits and pieces you have in that graph? No, no, I think that was... Exactly. What happens to this guy here? So if, if K3 goes to zero, essentially you can neglect that, this, the momentum of this propagator here is actually K1 plus K3. So you'll get a propagator which is K1 plus K3 squared. It goes on shell if K3 goes to zero. And so this is actually, by going on shell, it means it goes in, is going close to the infrared. It's, going, it's diving into the infrared region. Uh, similar, if K1 dot K3 go to zero, we're really speaking about, uh, if you go back now to what I had here, we're really speaking about if this goes collinear, then k1 dot k3 goes to zero, and if k1 dot k3 goes to zero, obviously k1 plus k3 goes to zero squared goes to zero as well, because k1 and k3 squared are zero. So in both cases, of in both these two guys, in both these two limits, we have k1 plus k3 going to zero, meaning that these two are genuinely infrared divergences. All right. So these are, I think this is important, the fact that uh, it's something I'll try to stick regularly or come back to regularly in these lectures. Uh, in a nutshell, really, any form of UV divergences goes into renormalization, at least in these renormalizable, renormalizable theories, like UCD. And what we're going to discuss over and over again through the week is what, what is the fate of infrared divergences. So the first thing in this case is, uh, so the first message in case of infrared divergences is this here. If you want to get a finite answer, you need to remember to include both real and virtual corrections. If you don't, one is infinite, the other one is infinite. And if you don't sum them properly, at the end of the day, you won't get the cancellation between these factors here, meaning that both real and virtual corrections are important. And this is actually, well, it's actually, there's, there's more to this. The fact that if you do sum them properly, at the end of the day, you do get something finite. And so th there's a theorem, which is, uh, there's two versions of the theorem. There's the block nordzig theorem. And I never remember how to spell those names properly. So uh, block. I think it's S, yeah. Uh, that's actually the version in principle for uh, electromagnetism, so not QCD. For non for abelian theories, for for non abelian theories, it's actually Kinoshita Lee and Nauenberg. And what this theorem states is that for inclusive quantities, for inclusive observables, summing, you get something finite, so summing real and virtual gives something finite order by order. So essentially this theorem tells you that what I sketched here by doing the first alpha s correction, you can actually repeat that procedure at any individual order after order in perturbation theory, you're guaranteed to find something finite. Okay? Now, so far, so good. There's a catch.
We've made progress, right? What we've essentially accomplished so far is to say that if you want to compute the cross-section for E plus E minus going to hadrons, inclusively, any possible hadroning final state, you'll get something finite at the end of the day. All right? That's great. That means QCD is giving you something finite. Excellent. I mean, I hope that, I hope that your expectations were higher when you came in here. Uh, if I can tell you that all I can do with a beautiful theory such as QCD is compute one number, or well, potentially one function. It's still a function of square root of s at the end of the day. Uh, that's probably a little bit disappointing, right? Uh, at the end of the day, you hope to be able to compute something more than just the inclusive cross-section just to produce any number of hadrons and then fine. Uh, so you want, at the very least, to be able to get some uh, some observables which are a bit more than just inclusive hadronic final state. You want to be able to do some measurements on the final state. I don't know, the probability to measure to get something uh, in your final state, to get constraints on your final state, impose cuts and whatever measurement you want to do. But if you think about what you would do at the LHC, you're not just measuring the cross-section proton-proton to anything. You're measuring the cross-section to have I don't know, uh, Higgs boson decaying to something, a TT bar pair, anything when you say you want something in the final state, you stop from being completely inclusive here. All right? Or potentially, Higgs, the Higgs case may actually be, uh, it can be inclusive in Higgs production in this case, but okay, let's leave that apart for the moment. Uh, so, it means that now, we're trying to get outside of the scope of the KLM theorem because we're no longer fully inclusive in the final state. And so this is, for anything which goes outside of inclusive observable, you need to be careful. And needing to be careful means you need infrared and collinear safety. Does anyone have an idea of what this is about? That means you need observables, giant for and are safe. Thanks. Uh, Right. To, to have, uh, for example, some ER, uh, okay. Okay. It's actually exactly the opposite. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so the idea is to rescue perturbative theory. Uh, so imagine now, I don't know, let me try to give a counterexample. Imagine I'm trying to count the number of quarks and gluons in the final state. So I'm trying to define an observable which, is, which does depend in a non-inclusive way on the final state. So imagine I'm trying to count the number of partons in the final state. Can you compute that in perturbative, QC, in perturbative QCD or not? Let's try. You start lowest order of the perturbation theory, you get two. So your distribution is just a delta peak at n equals two. First order correction, you can either get two via virtual corrections, or three via real emissions. So the probability to get three is going to be integrating this distribution here over x1 and x2. Any possible x1 and x2 gives you three particles in the final state. So the probability to get either three or two is just going to be infinite in both cases. All right? So this means essentially that perturbatively, the number of particles in the final state is crap. And indeed, in that case, you would have to come back to, uh, well, first of all, if you start getting, uh, you'll start getting into confinement issues because the number of quarks and gluons is undefined. But even if you start guessing the number of hadrons, the same problem happens. The same number of hadrons, imagine you make some stuff about how to get quarks into hadrons, you need to involve something on perturbative in there. All right? So the idea is, what do you want to impose a constraint in order to 
save the day and still be able to apply perturbative techniques to calculate the observable. So for this, essentially, you need to go back and ensure that what KLN was guaranteeing you is still valid. And what does KLN guarantees you? It guarantees that if you sum read in virtual, real, well, all infrared divergences do cancel. So in infrared nuclear safety is essentially a, a, a set of requirements that tells you that infrared divergences will cancel in your observable order by order of the, in, in, in perturbation theory. So the, the easiest way probably to write this down, and again, let me try to stick to the notations I have here. So imagine you want to compute a given observable, any observable. You can always, in, in perturbation theory, you can always say that this is the sum over order after order in perturbation theory. So order after order, you'll get one more, potentially one more particle in the final state, all right? So depending on the number of particles you have in the final state from two to infinity, you'll get an integration over the n-body phase space, some matrix element or, or say cross-section d sigma over d phi n which depends on momentum k1, kn. That's generic. I'm integrating over all possible phase space. The, essentially, the cross-section here is the appropriate weight for that phase space. Think about this as dx1, dx2, for example, in this case, uh, times whatever the value of my observable is computed on this n final state particle. This can include cuts, uh, cuts would be theta, uh, the heavy side functions in there. Then can impose constraints if you want to measure a differential distribution, which will be a delta function in there. Uh, the case of counting quarks and counting the number of partons would just be O n is n. That would be counting quarks and gluons. And I'm going to erase that immediately because that, as we just saw, doesn't make any sense. So with that notation, do you, could you see something that we need to impose on ON in order to guarantee that infrared divergences do cancel? And so this means, in other words, that if I, may, if I emit a soft gluon, well, the, remember that these happen either if I emit a soft gluon or if I emit a collinear gluon. Exactly. So imagine now I have a soft gluon, so it means that I'm adding a soft gluon. So I have Rn plus 1, K1, and I can't remember if I made Kn plus 1. I think Kn plus 1 should work. Uh, so imagine Kn plus 1 goes to 0. So Kn plus 1 becomes soft. If kn plus 1 goes to 0, it essentially means that the amplitude I get by adding this soft gluon here must cancel against the amplitude I had there when that soft gluon was actually virtual. They need to balance each other, all right? And so it means that if I want this cancellation to happen when k3 goes to zero, it means that my observable needs to categorize, or categorize these two topologies, so either soft k3 or virtual k3, virtual soft k3, these two needs to be categorized the same way, otherwise I'm just going to count plus infinity somewhere, minus infinity some in a different way, and these two infinities are not going to cancel. So for these two infinities to cancel, you need that if you add a soft gluon, you actually, the value of your observable does not change compared to the case where you did not have that soft emission. All right? So this means that if you take, in other words, if you take the soft limit of, the, so the, the part which is divergent, which is the limit where k n plus 1 becomes, becomes soft, uh, in the limit where k n plus 1 becomes soft, my observable become, is becoming this, and in the part when k n plus 1 is virtual, I 
if k n plus 1 is virtual, that means I only have n particles in the final state without n plus 1. My observable is this again. And so in the vicinity of k n plus 1 going to 0, I have exactly the same cancellation as the one I had in the case of the inclusive uh, measurement. So this is a requirement that actually guarantees that if you sum read and virtual, the divergences associated with kn plus 1 going to 0 are going to cancel. So this is infrared safety. And this is sort of a misnamer because we said actually infrared safety in this case is soft safety and not uh, I mean, there's a bit of a misnomer because infrared divergences includes both soft and green bar, while this one is actually just, just the soft part. Uh, similarly, you want that if one of the, if two of the particles become collinear, you again recover the same observable as if they were just a single particle. So if you have something, say k1, kn, and kn plus 1, in the limits where, uh, well, let me write this down differently. So if you have something where both become collinear, so Kn is actually split between some lambda Kn and some 1 minus lambda Kn, this goes to and that's for lambda between 0 and 1. And that's screening our safety. Yes? Or vice versa? Uh, there are obvious examples. Uh, I'll give you examples of things which are infrared and green are safe, and then we can uh, then we can talk. Uh, I think, w as far as I remember, one is easier to build than the other. I think something which is infrared safe and not green are safe is easier. Uh, something which is green are safe and not infrared safe uh, may be a bit more complicated. No, there, there, there might be there might be cases. I can I can trying to cook up something in a few minutes. So I think th this is really important. Because the key point, and I think this is something I want you to take home, is that if you have this requirement, it means that you can apply perturbative QCD. You're not forced into, well, the perturbative series is going to give you something. Uh, it does not mean that perturbative QCD is going to give, well, that, that you will not have any non perturbative corrections, right? It means that by going order after order in perturbative QCD, you will get something meaningful. You won't get something that diverges where you do need to introduce some infrared regulator or infrared non perturbative physics in order to save the day. You can compute things in perturbative QCD. There's no guarantee that this is going to give you the, uh, the, uh, the exact physical answer. One way, and let me clear that out immediately, the question is, a, a different way to phrase that is, the question is, what's the size of non-perturbative corrections that you would expect? Okay? Any observable in QCD is going to be non-perturbative is going to have some contribution from non perturbative hydronic corrections, whatever this, this means. And essentially what this tells you is that by going to high energy, you're going to become more and more perturbative. So this essentially tells you that if you do compute an observable, the non perturbative corrections will include something like lambda QCD. They do depend on lambda QCD. If, you're, if you are not in Fred and Colinear safe, correction can be of order one or dominant. If you have something which is in Fred and Colinear safe, typically the corrections would be, so the non perturbative corrections would go like, in this case, some power of lambda QCD over, in any e plus and minus collision is square root of s. In generic cases, it's whatever hard scale you have in the problem. But typically, this guarantees more, or well, more or less guarantees that at the end of the day, your non perturbative corrections are just power suppressed instead of being of order one. 
In other words, if you go to high enough energy, the higher you go in energy, the higher your hard scale, the better your QCD prediction is. And we all, will, we anyway know from the beginning that QCD, perturbative QCD is, is mostly high energy stuff. If you go down to the mass of the proton, uh, getting anything from perturbative QCD becomes uh, at best optimistic. All right? So what next? Uh, next is, I've told you a list of great ways to save the day. Now it means that we can think of constraining the final state of the collision and do something more than computing the e plus e minus to any number of hadrons final state. Can you give me a good observable? Is there any observable you can think of that would satisfy these constraints? It's actually not that easy. I guess that could work, yes. So, transverse momentum being like this, I guess that, that um, yeah, that would work. That would work. So at the same time, yeah, that, that, that would definitely work. You can even compute it order by order in perturbation theory, I think that would work. Uh, the question here is, what would you try to achieve with this observable? And one question that people have repeatedly asked over the years about these uh, final state observables is to try and understand the uh, topology of the final state. Okay? What is typically going to be the shape of the QCD radiation in the final state uh, and, and essentially, if I, can, if I can put that in two extreme perspective, if you look at an event, uh, look at LEP, the, probably the uh, best known E plus and minus collider, uh, at least in, in this room. Uh, the question is, if you look at an event, is it going to look like something where I don't know, I can probably put it, yeah, something where, let me draw it this way, something where the particles look more like this, or where the particles look more like this. Again, think about this in three dimensions, I have a hard time drawing these kind of things in three dimensions. All right? So it, it's a very generic question. If I look at the topology, the distribution of the particles in the final state, is it something that looks more or less homogeneous with particles flying in all directions, or something that looks more like particles flying in two or potentially a few more definite directions? All right? And so people started in trying building observables to try and quantify this. All right. Uh, in a way, I think measuring the transverse momentum of the final state is is indeed something which uh, which would be in fact linear safe. Uh, but the transverse momentum of the final state, with respect to the b-maxes, is essentially more sensitive to all the Euler angles. Is definitely sensitive to all the Euler angles I've I've introduced at the beginning. So it's not something directly which is sensitive to the internal dynamics of the QQ bar gluon system. Okay. While here, what we're really looking after is really to quantify the dynamics of the final state, essentially with trying to get free of what happens as free as possible of what happens in the initial state. I guess this is this is the difference in that in that regard. And probably the best observable that people are still studying now is something called thrust. And you'll see that this is a bit more complicated than, so thrust, and again, let me make sure I'm using the same normalization as the one I have 
I have here. It's just, so T, it is just defined. So for thrust, you're actually going to, to take, take a direction. Take a direction U, any unit vector going in any possible direction, a three vector, unit three vector, going pointing in any direction. For that vector, I can compute the sum of the modulus of the sum of all particles in the final state, ki dot u, divided by the sum of modulus of ki. That I can do. I've just taken any direction. I'm projecting any momentum on that direction, summing the modulus of these numbers, and normalizing with the, essentially, energy of the final state. And what I'm going to do is maximize this over any possible unit three vectors. Not that trivial, right? There is actually some, there is a way to quote unquote easily understand this. Imagine your final state is something like that. Just imagine for now. Essentially, you see that the vector u that you're going to get is essentially this guy here. Somewhere a line here, there's a vector where essentially you get all, all particles in this side are aligned with u. All particles here are essentially aligned with minus u, but since I'm taking the modulus, and in this case, obviously, the, this, is, this is the maximal axis. So essentially what you do here by trying to maximize over this is trying to find really the, the basic two directions in your event, really. So if you think about e plus e minus going to q q bar as we started, remember we're in the center of mass energy, quark goes one direction, anti-quark goes the opposite direction. In that case, obviously, u is just going to align with any of these is going to align with a quark and anti-quark. And so this k dot u is k, uh, k dot q bar, sorry, q bar dot u is, is, is q bar as well. So this t goes to one, okay? So for e plus e minus going to q q bar, you'll just get t equals one, whatever the orientation of the q q bar pair. Is that in front of safe? The answer better be yes, otherwise I just shoot myself in the foot. So what happens if you want to test infrared and linear safety? Go back to the definition, test infrared safety. You add a soft particle to that event. That means I have a list of particles in my event. I'm adding an infinitely soft one. So I'm adding a particle with infinitesimally small momentum. What happens to the numerator here? It gets a ridiculously tiny correction. What happens to the denominator? Same thing, it gets a ridiculously tiny correction. What happens to the whole fraction? It gets a ridiculously tiny correction, which goes to zero in the limit where it ridiculously goes to zero. Okay? Infrared safety check. Collinear safety. If I take one particle, split it into two particles exactly collinear, essentially what I'm going to say is that ki dot u is just going to be equal to lambda ki dot u plus one minus lambda ki dot u. This is just... Sorry? And same thing in the denominator. If I change ki with lambda, I can always write any of the ki times lambda ki plus one minus lambda ki. So if I make a collinear splitting of any of the particles, the value of t will not change. So this means that this observable is both infrared and collinear safe. Meaning I can hope to integrate this in perturbative QCD. And how do you do that? Well, you go back to all the nice formula that I've partially hidden on the right-hand side of the board. And that means you need to integrate over... So what I'm looking at here, just one step back, I'm looking at the distribution in thrust. So I'm looking at what's the probability 
what I'm going to do is, imagine you do that ex experimentally, right? You take all the events from lab. For each event, you can measure thrust. And I'm just binning the distribution. So we're really looking at this sigma d thrust. Okay? As I told you, leading order of perturbation theory, zero order in alpha s, uh, let me normalize this just to make sure I get a number so I don't have to carry out sigma zeros and whatnot in front of it. Leading order of the perturbation theory is just this. That's what I told you. Whatever I'm doing, I almost, um, if I do e plus e minus q to q q bar, I'm always getting t equals one. So leading order of Leading order of perturbation theory is just delta 1 minus t. Uh, now I can actually get the order alpha s correction. And the order alpha s corrections, I'll need to integrate over x1 and x2. So I need to integrate dx1, dx2, with the matrix element to get the appropriate x1 and x2, which in this case, uh, leaving aside e, q, n, c, sigma, not factors that I factored out, there's an alpha s cf over 2 pi, there's an x1 squared plus x2 squared over 1 minus x1, 1 minus x2. I'm essentially just applying the, the expression I've written here, right? Just trying here to just integrate over the phase space times the cross-section is just that here in that phase space I've already integrated out all the Euler angles that I don't care about. And now I need the value of this observable. So essentially at this stage, what goes in the square bracket here is I'm giving you an event where I have three particles in the final state, a quark carrying out with an energy fraction x1, an antiquark with an energy fraction x2, and a gluon with an energy fraction x3, which is 2 minus x1 minus x2. What's the value of thrust for this event? Uh, Sounds horrendous. It's actually a back of an envelope calculation. Uh, it's actually fairly easy to get you. It's a, I, I will not do it. Uh, I'll, leave it to, I'll leave it to you as an exercise. If you try and struggle, let me know. I can do it tomorrow. Uh, it's a two-step exercise. The first one is to realize that if you want to maximize u, so you need to do that, that max of u awful thing, right? Uh, it's actually fairly easy to realize first that u has to be aligned with any of the particles in the, in the initial state, oh, in the final state. Uh, so U is either to be aligned with K1, K2, and K3, and actually if you just slightly bend it from U, K1, K3, you actually, the idea is that you get cosine, and cosine is more than one. That's essentially all that there is. Uh, so this means that you need to get uh, U to, al to be aligned with, K with either K1, K2, and K3. The other thing is that if I'm actually splitting what U does, is really, so imagine u goes in this direction, okay? Imagine this is my u. What I'm really doing is separating the event into a right side and a left side. There's a bunch of particles flowing in the direction of u for which this is positive. There's a bunch of particles flowing the left side for which this is negative. All right, so far so good. Uh, and because of momentum conservation, whatever flows on the left side is the opposite of whatever flows on the right side. And in that case, I can just apply momentum conservation to say that this is twice what goes in the right side. And so in that case, I can also assume, since I only have three particles in the final state, I can always assume that there's one on the right and two on the left. Otherwise, I just flip u to minus u. And if there's only one particle here, it means that there's only either k1, k2, or k3, which is aligned with u. And so this is just modulus of k1 divided by the same thing here. So at the end of the day, what you get is that t has to be, so there's a delta, t has to be, that I need to maximize over all possible values of u. Maximizing over all possible values of u is essentially maximize over all possible ki, k2, k3 dot u, which is actually x1, x2, or x3 in this case. And so that's the max of all the xi. Not at this order, uh, next order, things become a bit more complicated because you can have uh, two particles on each side. So for any value of t, which is not 1, 
I can actually compute these things. If the maximum value of x is smaller than 1, it means I'll never reach any divergence where either x1 or x2 hits 1, by definition, right? Uh, if I impose that the maximum is 0 0.9, I'll never have 1 in my phase space, okay? That's uh, a very trivial statement. Uh, this, uh, this calculation, this integration can actually be calculated, and if you do that, you actually get 1 over sigma d sigma dt, which is alpha s cf over 2 pi, times some horrendous function, well, horrendous function. Uh, it's QCD, right? You don't expect two simple expressions, or at least these guys are essentially as simple as they can ever get. Uh, t squared times t1 minus t log 2t minus 1 over 1 minus t minus 3, 2 minus t, 3t minus 2 over 1 minus t. Isn't that great? Question number one, why is it great? I'm actually going to finish with a brief discussion on this. Why is it great? Don't have too high an expectation. It is great because it is... We can calculate it. It's finite. Perturbative QCD gives you a prediction for the distribution. You can measure it, compare it to whatever you measure. Go to higher order, you can still calculate alpha squared, alpha cube corrections, and compare it to data. Well, that's a great point. What's the not so great thing? Told you, I can't. I told you. Here, yeah, I'm taking t smaller than one. Is there anything potentially fishy in that expression? Just trying to visualize this. I'm trying to really measure as a function of t between, actually at this order the lower end point is one half. Maybe even, ha 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 ha, uh, sorry, is it one half? Yeah, potentially one half. I would have said two thirds, but okay. Uh, one half actually is good. Uh, one over sigma, is it one half? No, it's actually bigger than that. The higher spawn, I think, is three quarters. I actually did compute. No, sorry, it's two thirds. I'm used to work with one minus t and correcting from one to the other is actually more complicated. Uh, the highest value you can get is actually two thirds. The smallest you can get is two thirds. Essentially because the sum of xi is two, and so the, the max of xi, the smallest value you can get is two-thirds, 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 which corresponds to a uh, Mercedes-Benz kind of uh, topology in the final state. So the smallest value you can get is two-thirds, the largest value you can get is one, and then try to look at this expression, visualize it in that range. What's dangerous here? Don't look too far. Again, I told you this is a simple lecture. T equals 1. If you start getting too close to T equals 1, you get 1 minus T. You get 1 minus T. You get log of 1 minus T. That is becoming delicate. So this means that diverge, this, this distribution, if you go close to T equals 1, starts diverging. Even if you try to plot 1 minus t times this sigma dt, you still get a logarithmic divergence. So the way to do this is even if you try to, yeah, really, if you try to put a 1 minus t here, just to say 1 minus t is just a change of variable. I can always redefine and look at d log 1 minus t instead of dt. Even in that case, I'm still getting here a log of 1 minus t. The log of 2 t minus 1 is irrelevant because 1 half is outside of the range, but the log of 1 minus t is relevant. 
And this is the last thing I like to mention. Why do you get that log? Why do you get that behavior? What happens physically if you try to get t close to 1? Remember, back here, I say is t is smaller than 1 guarantees that we're actually shielding this x1, x2 going to 1 divergence. If I start getting t close to 1, it means x1 and x2 can actually start approaching t equal, start approaching 1. They're not exactly reaching 1, so you get something which is finite, but the more you go close to 1, you start feeling sensitive to this, to this here. All right? And so essentially, in this case, you have, uh, you have two sorts of divergences. We saw you have epsilon squared and epsilon pole. The epsilon square pole essentially become the, uh, the square divergence. If you're just starting to get there, this square divergence becomes, becomes essentially this log 1 over 1 minus t. There is another, uh, there's actually a, the epsilon pole in this case would become the constant over 1 minus t, which you see there. And uh, this whole structure of what happens close to t equals 1 is essentially one thing I was planning to discuss in the uh, going to all orders. This is a region in which essentially when t becomes close to 1, the perturbative expansion breaks down. Because alpha s, even if alpha s is small, at some point this number is big. And so you cannot just say this is a correction compared to uh, the small number we had at the beginning. So this, just to give you a taste, is the kind of ideas I wanted to discuss in the advanced part about going all orders. Uh, so we're summing these to all orders in perturbation theory. Uh, so I'm going to finish here. With that example, uh, homework for tomorrow, if you cannot sleep tonight, try to think about other infrared and Kunyar safe or infrared and Kunyar unsafe observables, either infrared or Kunyar. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, uh, I'm happy to release you to lunch and see you tomorrow. I'm in Office 105 all afternoon if you want. Any question? Great, then if you have any topic you want to hear out the rest of the week, you know where to find me and 